you have to ask yourself, well, if I'm not able to build anything, and I'm not able to find co founders, am I ready to be a founder? What I've heard candidly from other investors is if you can't find co founders, and you can't build a product, well, you failed the first two tests of being an entrepreneur. So just be aware of how you'll be perceived in the marketplace. If you don't know how to build a product. This week in startups is brought to you by Wistia is the all in one video platform for business with tools that help you create, manage and measure the impact of your videos. Try Wistia for free at wistia.com slash startups. Eight sleep. Good sleep is the ultimate game changer. Now you can add the pod cover to any mattress. Go to 8sleep.com slash twist to check out the pod cover and get $200 off the pod plus free shipping. And Northwest Registered Agent. When starting your business, it's important to use a service that will actually help you. Northwest Registered Agent is that service. They'll form your company fast, give you the documents you need to open a business bank account, and even provide you with mail scanning and a business address to keep your personal privacy intact. Visit northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist to get a 60% discount on your next LLC. All right, everybody, welcome back to this week in startups. Everybody loves to know uh, what startups are we investing in at my venture capital fund. The fund is called Launch. You can go to launch.co to learn a little bit more about our fund. We are a pre-seed and a seed stage fund primarily. And one of the things we learned how to do uh, early on was find startups um, that were very nascent, they were in their formation uh, stage. And we love to help those founders navigate, you know, all the blocking and tackling the simple steps that you need to get done in that first year, or as we like to call it year zero, when you're just getting ready to start up. And so we created a product called Founder University. And Founder universities, I, I like to refer to it as a pre accelerator. So before you go to Y Combinator, Techstars, or in fact, our accelerator launch accelerator, we like to have something. Uh, and it turns out this 12 week course we created has been highly effective, uh, at least that's what founders tell us in helping them get started. And about half the companies that apply to founder university, they come to the program, um, not even incorporated yet. So with me is Presh. He's an associate here at Launch. He helps run the Founder University program with Kelly on my team. Presh, welcome back to the program. You heard my little preamble there. Thank you, Jason. Good to be here. Tell everybody a little bit about Founder University and maybe how it's evolved over the last couple of classes as we've invested more of our time and effort into running the program. Yeah. So yeah, as you said, 12-week program. We started cohort one, which was Really, any we, we let anyone with an idea into the program. Um, then we've evolved the program, each cohort slightly changing. And so now we're, we're starting our eighth cohort, uh, which starts just under a month, May 9th. Applications are still open for that. And um, with the eighth cohort and the last iterations, we've really been prioritizing builder founders into the program. And um, builder founders, we define that um, specifically. So that's like a combination of developer, designer, growth hacker, a combination, uh, or all three. So that's how we define a builder. And we prioritize teams mm. because um, we've noticed startups are hard. And so <laughs> they are <laughs> correct. Yeah. And so having a co-founder, you know, makes things just a little bit easier, maybe even a lot easier, you know, especially when you have three people going after it, you know, two or three co-founders, if somebody's having a bad day, bad week, um, or they don't have a certain skill set, you can rely on your co founder or even two co founders. Three seems to be the magic number. Uh, we see sometimes people start with four, go down to two or three. Sometimes we p- see people start with one, and that person burns out or, you know, just isn't able to raise capital or have enough talent in that organization uh, to compete with the people who maybe have two or three co founders. So finding a co founder is job one, and being able to build something. I mean, what what have we found with solo founders and idea people, <laughs> idea people, you know, I have an idea, but I can't execute on it. What have we found with those startups historically? Yeah, I think it's just lack of direction as well. So the solo founder with an idea will come in um, and then not really build anything in the 12 weeks. And so that's what we kind of consider a failure of the program. 
as long as you build something and you put it out in the world, that's, you know, step number one. Um, but the, the solo founders that don't do that, that's what we're not optimizing for. Kind way of saying it. Um, you know, we, we have to place bets. And so what you have to ask yourself as a founder coming into it, hey, you're listening to This Week in Startups, maybe you want to come to founder.university, that's where you can apply. You have to ask yourself, well, if I'm not able to build anything, and I'm not able to find co-founders, am I ready to be a founder? Uh, what I've heard candidly from other investors is if you can't find co-founders, and you can't build a product, well, you failed the first two tests of being an entrepreneur. So just be aware of how you'll be perceived in the marketplace. If you don't know how to build a product and Gosh, in today's uh, world, you're building your side hustle, you have your, your plunge app, you're able to build it, you have a co founder, and you've got product velocity, the product keeps improving. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so you've learned this firsthand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, kind of just taken the lessons in in the program from our, our, our content that we do and uh, done that as a kind of experiment alongside founder university. So kind of dog fooding the founder university curriculum and product. You can go see that. Is it GoPolar is the uh, URL? Yeah. GoPolar.app. Okay. Yep. There you go. You can go check out his cold plunge uh, app and uh, see how Presh has built it. All right. So today we're going to have three or four of the founders from this cohort pitch me, and then we'll decide who we're going to invest in here live on the air, right? That's correct. We got three founders lined up. All right. Let's get started. Uh, I'm going to give them two or three minutes to pitch their idea, and then I'll ask them some questions. Sounds good. Okay. First up, we've got Jared from Umbrella Sports. Welcome, Jared. Now, Jared, remember, some number of people are only listening. So it's important that if you're showing something uh, that you sportscast it. In other words, explain what they're seeing on the screen. Okay, sounds good. All right, you're ready. Three, two, go. Hi, I'm Jared Lewandowski, founder of Umbrella Sports and creator of Smart Grip. Golf is hard, very hard, but it doesn't have to be. Introducing Smart Grip. On a mission to fix my own slice, I created Smart Grip to be discreet and effective, giving me more distance and confidence off the tee. We launched a successful crowdfunding campaign in 2022 to validate the idea and refine the hardware and sold hundreds of units around the world. The feedback has been incredible. We will offer two models. Our entry-level experience Smart Grip is available today, and it's permitted for use in golf tournaments by the USGA, giving us the unique ability to collect critical grip position and swing motion data while under pressure and compare that to practice data. And next month, we'll be launching a companion app featuring order tracking, a referral program, and an in-app subscription model with premium personalized content. With golf embracing technology and other sports industries already there, Let's talk about Smart Grip Pro, which will let golfers easily view and share their performance data with friends, coaches, and club fitters. Focused first on delivering an exceptional user experience. We will hit our first 100 million by the end of 2025 via B2C through hardware sales and subscriptions. But our biggest opportunity is on the B2B side, where we'll hit 1 billion by 2030 delivering tournament performance data and enabling software integration through exclusive partnerships with golf simulators and launch monitors and entertainment golf companies. Access to tournament performance data will also enable golf club manufacturers to make better golf equipment for competing under pressure. Professional and collegiate coaches will be more effective with their students. And with a smart grip enhanced fitting process, those seven iron warm up swings at club fittings will be a lot less awkward. Our unfair advantage is my career as a product design leader, my love for the game of golf, and my co founder's experience in global production and manufacturing. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to pitch today. All right, very good. Uh, massive <laughs> revenue expectations there. A hundred million by the end of twenty twenty five. A billion by twenty thirty. Uh, we like the audacity. Um, and so, what you've built is a hardware device that attaches to a golfer's golf glove, which are specific for that sport. It looks like it goes on the back of the hand, and it must have a battery, an accelerometer, and some other sensors in it that let you track the swing. And in some way, you're able to use an algorithm or, or some machine learning to figure out what the swing was, and then um, maybe give some advice on how to improve it. Yeah, that this is the core product. Correct. Yeah. And, and we built it first and foremost, to be effective, it, it solves a problem. Right now, we see a lot of golf technology that tells you more about the problem, but doesn't fix it for you at all. Got it. Uh, where this will be immediately effective. As soon as you put it on, you'll hit better. Got it. And uh, it looks like it's 150 bucks for the regular version, $500 for the pro. Is that per year, per month, per day? 
one-time fee? Uh, how do you charge for the product here? Because it wasn't exactly clear. Yep, that is for the hardware piece alone. Both units will be will have the same insides. And so what we can do is if you buy the entry level and you decide you wanted the uh, higher end model, we can enable the data tracking. And then on top of that, we'll be charging a $99 per year uh, subscription fee for that as well. It looks like the build of materials on this is not going to be super expensive, probably tens of dollars, I'm guessing. Yeah, we have it down to around 30, 35 bucks. To, so to I wonder why put this friction up front of a high price or have two different models. Why not just make it, you know, 20 bucks a month? $150 a year and call it a day and simplify the pricing. Uh, we've seen being a golfer myself, I'm very familiar with the technology and the, in the industry and what, what golfers are willing to pay. Uh, we're right in the middle, actually probably on the lower to middle end of where the price point for this type of technology, when you're thinking about um, anything that can help you related to data. So TrackMan, for example, is $2,000 or up. Uh, so we feel like we're pretty competitive in our man? pricing and won't have any. TrackMan is a, uh, it'll track your, your swing and where your ball goes. It only tracks a six inch zone, uh, essentially just a do? launch What's monitor. Its hardware? What is its hardware profile? Uh, it uses a, uh, a video and a laser within it. So it's able to track that six inch zone where you make the impact. Got it. Smart oh, so this is like something that. you would install at a... Potentially. Yeah. So yes. no, no, but I'm saying that the product you're talking about, that's $2,000 is a fixed installation. It's not something you just strap yes. as a wearable. Got it. Okay. And you can't, and to add to that real quick, Jason, you can't bring it to you with a turn on a, you can't bring it with you sure. to a tournament, put it up on the tee box after, <laughs> before every shot, mm. uh, where we'll be able to capture that. Great. Awesome. And so hardware is hard, Presh. We normally don't invest in hardware, but hardware enabled subscriptions, uh, we do have an exception for hardware is hard. What have you seen, Presh, in terms of the investment community when they see not only hardware, but consumer hardware? What are, the, what are the lessons yeah. we've learned in that space? Yeah. And before I answer that, I actually also want to point out, so Jared was, Jared came to founder university cohort five oh. uh, with just the hardware Got it. Um, and no, no kind of vision on the software side at that point. And then joined cohort seven, our latest one with more uh, thinking around building the, in into a Hass product. Hass being? Uh, hardware as a service. Got it. As and opposed so, to software as a service that businesses use. What have we seen right. fresh from the investment community when we introduce our founders, you know, at the pre seed stage or seed stage, when we email folks and say, hey, we've got this great hardware company. What is the reaction typically? Yeah, typically not not the greatest um, for a specific reason of hardware being a one time sale and having to upsell on different products over time versus um, a subscription, right? Similar to SaaS. Um, you get the hardware, which is an upfront fee, and then a subscription model that's going to be more predictable revenue for the company. And then investors like that, because um, now you can see how that grows, um, not having to continuously sell into the customer. Awesome. All right. Well done, Jared. Hey everyone, quick shout out to our friends at Wistia. Wistia is the ultimate tool every marketer needs to supercharge the video strategy. It's a powerhouse for generating leads. And I want to tell you about one really specific feature that Wistia has. When you're playing a video, let's say it's a tutorial video, and it's teaching people how to use your SaaS product, or even your consumer product. Well, a pop up can appear in the video that says for more information or to book a meeting, put your email in right now. This is transformative. You can't do this with other video players. That's why you use Wistia. You get to capture people's email addresses right in the video. You have to see it. It is going to increase conversions for your webinars, for your book demos by at least 10x. And Wistia is going to seamlessly integrate into all your tools, Marketo, HubSpot, Paradot. This means all those fresh leads are going to go automatically into your marketing platform. And you can take those leads and score them and then get them into your nurture flows where you're nurturing those leads and turning them into happy customers. Keep moving them through your sales funnel effortlessly with Wistia. They even let you add custom CTAs calls to actions to your videos to drive prospects to the next stage of your funnel. So if you're looking to elevate your lead gen, streamline lead nurturing and enhance user engagement with advanced analytics, Wistia is the perfect tool for you. Wistia is everything a marketer needs to create, host, analyze and market video. Try Wistia for free by heading over to wistia.com slash startups, W-I-S-T-I-A dot com slash startups. Let's meet our next founder. All right, we've got Linda from MasterTech. Okay, Linda, welcome to the program. 
You have two minutes to pitch. Three, two, go. Hi, we are MasterTech AI, and we're using AI to make auto repair faster, easier, and safer for shops and DIYers. Meet John. John is an auto technician working at an independent shop. Unlike in dealerships, John needs to be able to service any of the up to 60,000 unique models of vehicles that exist in the U.S. today. However, there is no current software platform that can easily aggregate all the information he needs. As a result, John will often only rely on his personal experience, and with a shortage of qualified technicians in the industry, vehicles are often misdiagnosed and repairs are done incorrectly. Introducing MasterTech AI. MasterTech AI will aggregate all technical service bulletins, community data, along with the vehicle's personal service history so that John can easily access all the information he needs to quickly root cause vehicle issues. Additionally, when it comes to performing repairs, MasterTech AI will guide John through OEM specifications and procedures with an AI conversational interface. To ensure data accuracy, we are finalizing licensing agreements with OEM data providers for all vehicles. MasterTech AI will also index the most relevant DIY demonstrations from YouTube where parts, tools, steps, and warnings are extracted. This ensures that the job can be done safely and efficiently, preventing mistakes and comebacks. There are over 240,000 auto repair shops in the U.S. To get to 10 million ARR, we will need over 2,700 shops. To get to 100 million ARR, we will need over 27,000 shops. The, our team consists of myself with 17 years of engineering experience at Microsoft and Niantic. My co-founder, Dave, has over two decades of experience in the auto repair industry, including only in operating a seven-figure shop. Thank you. We are MasterTech AI, and we're using AI to make auto repair faster, easier, and safer for shops and DIYers. Oh, wow. So absolutely fantastic. Great presentation. Uh, you are taking all of the knowledge out there on how to fix cars. You mentioned these bulletins that come out. I guess these are things that, um, you know, Honda or Tesla, I think they do most of the repairs themselves, but, you know, the Hondas of the world, uh, the Toyotas of the world, they come out with these bulletins, say, here's what's wrong with the axle, the transmission, the engine, spark plugs, whatever it happens to be. You want to put that into a language model and have uh, technicians be able to ask questions hey this is what i'm seeing and then it would inform them here are the possible ways to diagnose it or fix it and then you also seem to say this would be also for diy folks so i guess consumers could go use this language model the question always becomes here Presh, how is this better or different than what you could do natively with you know gemini claude or um you know open ai whatever language model is out there so, Linda, how will this be different than uh, what I can natively do if I say, hey, I'm hearing some clanking from my Toyota uh, Odyssey, you know, it's a 2017 model. How is your system going to have an advantage over, say, ChatGPT? Absolutely. Um, so the, the advantage that comes with any AI model or any sort of vertical AI application is with the data. Right now, if you go to ChatGPT or any of the other AI chatbots, you will get some generic answer if you ask those types of questions, but they do not have either in the training data or direct access to all of the OEM uh, specifications and procedures. So, you know, from my, you know, kind of all those things I've learned in this space, there's actually a vast amount of technical data that's specific to every vehicle, right? That's specific to the year make model and even beyond that, the sub model, the trim, the engine type. And, um, these are things that could ver make a huge difference as far as, you know, how to do it correctly versus doing it incorrectly and causing the car to be in an unsafe state for the technician and on the road. So we are licensing actually the OEM data directly through a data provider from the OEMs and we are finalizing the approval process and we've gotten approved for majority of the data that we need. So we are able to leverage that data um, with our, our RAG retrieval so that we can get them the exact data that uh, for their vehicle. And so that that's for the OEM procedures along with the technical service bulletins. So, so these are like known issues that are put out by the manufacturers. What would the interface for these be? What's the interface for the interaction? Is it going to be the mechanic takes out their smartphone and talks to uh, or they type into their phone, or do they wear AR glasses and record videos of what they're doing in real time? 
How, what's the interface like for the mechanic? The interface to start off with will be a, a web interface for the, the chatbot. So the technicians today, um, often they will have a personal laptop that they use to look up information oh. before they start the job. So this is where how they're looking up technical information today. So that's we're providing a faster, easier, more accurate way to, to do so that. So they'll have a laptop open, they go to a browser, they ask yes. the question there, they type it in, got it. And in the future, do you ever see, you know, people wearing a camera or something to that effect? Because it does seem to me proprietary data would be very valuable if you can get this in the hands of a thousand mechanics. And let's say they were wearing AR glasses or even just like the 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 off the shelf, uh, you know, cameras attached to a camera, a, a camera attached to their shoulder or something. If you could actually record them repairing stuff, my lord, you could you could get some really good proprietary data. So so tell me about where you think this might go in the future. Absolutely, all of that is on our roadmap. So we're starting out with the the web browser ex uh, app experience. Um, and then we're going to uh, look to build a, a voice assistant, right? So these mechanics, you know, they're working on when they're actually doing the job, they need to be hand free from, you know, using a digital device. So the easiest, you know, kind of product to build next is to do a voice assistant, right, maybe a mobile, uh, mobile app that that is voice first. Um, and then really, AR has always been our long term vision, you know, the like Microsoft, you know, AR headset, one of their first demos was for uh, you know, technicians to be able to visualize all the specifications as they're twerking like the specific parts of, of the car. And, uh, and there's been a lot of like really interesting demos that people have like hacked together using Apple Vision Pro as well, where they have like YouTube running on one side with a demonstration along with Got some it. technical so data. So lens type thing. Yes. Uh, you could put that on and you could get some extra advice. And then there's a middle ground where being able to talk to the assistant and say, you know, and I changed spark plug number four, still not working. And it maybe gives you another idea. Absolutely fantastic. How are you going to charge for it? What's the pricing? Yeah, so we are looking to uh, uh, be around $300 per month for these shops. Um, and that's around the ballpark range that they're paying for similar kind of data providers for how they look up technical information today. Great. 300 bucks a month, $4,000 a year. Sounds like a great pricing model. And is the product in market yet? Do you have anybody testing it or using it? So for our new MVP, we're launching it May 1st. Um, so this is with the OEM data. Yes. Awesome. May 1st, we'll have some more information. So this is what happens at the pre-seed. <laughs> we have a vision, we have some mock-ups, and we're trying to make a decision. Do we believe Linda's vision? Do we believe she can execute with all this great experience at Microsoft and working in AR before? Well done, Linda. Elite performers have a secret and it helps them stand out in their field. You want to know what that secret is? I can tell you it's sleep. Whether you're an athlete, an entrepreneur, or you're just a career driven professional like the people who listen to this podcast, quality sleep is the fuel that powers your success. Well, how do you get deep, restful sleep? Very simple. You do what I do eight sleep. I got two eight sleep mattresses. I never miss a night on my eight sleep and they're selling more than just mattresses right now. You can sleep like a champion with the eight sleep pod cover. That's right. You don't have to get rid of your existing mattress. You put the cover on, slips right on top of your bed and instantly transforms your sleep game. We're talking about dual zone heating and cooling. So if you have a partner and you're both in the same bed, you know, one might sleep hot, one might sleep cold. I like it a little chilly willy. And this smart temperature adjustment keeps you in your ideal zone for a deeper uninterrupted rest. In other words, you set how you like it, but it adjusts the temperature to make you sleep more. This is really interesting science, folks. And this advanced sleep tracking will help you monitor your metrics like your heart rate. And if you can measure it, you can manage it. That's the secret of eight sleep and get that eight sleep pond cover fits any mattress. It's going to work well with whatever you got. And when you maximize your sleep, you maximize your potential. You know that. So whether you're having sleep problems or you just want to optimize, here's your call to action. I want you to invest in the rest that you deserve. Go to eight sleep.com slash twist and get 200 bucks off the pod cover. What a great deal. Eight sleep.com slash twist for $200 off the pod plus free shipping. Who's up next, Fresh? All right. Next up, we've got Alexander from Ellis. Okay. Alexander, welcome to the program. Tell us a little bit about what you're working on with Ellis. Hey, I'm Alexander, the CEO and co-founder of Ellis, where we help startups get customers. Oh, so imagine like for a the second sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> imagine for a second you're a business owner or a startup founder, and the first thing you want to do is go out into the market and try to get some customers. So you're going to try and do that with a cold email campaign. First thing you're going to do is work with the registrar to buy a domain. 
I hope you chose one with a great UI because you're going to spend some time manually configuring it. Work with one of these providers, demarking or postmark, to have continuous monitoring in place so spammers don't use your domain. You're going to work with uh, Microsoft private email or Gmail to get an actual inbox and then warm that inbox up with instantly or warm up inbox. Now you're going to have to buy a MailChimp, SendGrid or HubSpot subscription, set up the campaign, make sure that your campaign and all of your services are compliant with Google and Yahoo's new sender guidelines, buy a B2B contact database or find the people you're going to contact manually, and then glue all this together. And now you can finally go out and start an email campaign. But that was extremely exhausting. And when I first wanted to do this, I just wanted to pay someone that knew what they were doing to handle all this for me. So I built Ellis, a unified B2B email marketing platform that lets you reach out to leads like you know them. We automate all of the setup I just mentioned, uh, and we personalize every single email that goes out with AI. And our spam rates are less than two in a thousand of our emails go to spam. At the end of the day, that's a 5x better conversion rate for you than if you use the traditional a uh, templated email marketing system. We charge a monthly subscription and a credit for each person we contact. We never charge if your email bounces or go to spam. And it's 50% plus margins on all of our accounts. In our first four months of launch, we've got nine customers, eight startups and an enterprise. And we've crossed 1200 MRR last November. Happy to answer any questions you have, Jake, uh, Jason. Okay, yeah, call me J. Cal if you like. Uh, <laughs> very nicely done. I know this problem firsthand. I've had countless startups ask me, how do we warm up our emails? How do we not wind up in spam filters? How do we do sequences that don't annoy people? You know, anybody who's in business right now, you get far too many off topic, spammy feel, uh, you know, sequences. But sometimes you get a sequence and I, I get some that I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. It is targeted. I'd like to know more about it. So I think what you're building um, should, uh, because it's going to cost money, and because it's not free, you should get people who have real products, real services, and I guess, you'll say no to people who feel spammy so that you can keep your service uh, a little bit more high end. What, what does it cost for somebody to use the service? How do you charge? 300 a month subscription and 500 for 1000 people to contact. Okay, so $300 a month for a subscription. That's the baseline subscription for a one domain name, 10 salespeople, one salesperson. Uh, how does it work in terms of, you know, somebody using it for, you know, if you had 500 salespeople versus I don't know how many salespeople or emails you can send with a $300 a month version. So we work with startups. So we don't have any seat based pricing right now. Uh, okay. That's just for yeah, company. Got it. Okay, so you'll figure out when you get to larger enterprises, how much to charge, you'll have small, medium, large. Uh, Fresh, you you've done a lot of this kind of email sequencing before in your career. Um, tell me a little bit about how you would assess this service compared to the Franken service, you would have to build yourself and you probably have built. Yeah, um, problem definitely there. You know, we do this for a launch, bunch of launch domains I had to go through a similar process. So that all makes sense. I think a lot of the interesting piece is um, not landing in spam and having creative emails that catch people's attention. Um, so the combination of those two things, I think, is what is really uh, to outline here and why we think like Ellis is interesting. It's a huge problem. Everyone's doing for B2B companies, like you mentioned, you know, email is the primary source of communication there for all those deals. Um, and so as long as you can get in front of all the thousands of emails you get in a day, there's like some insight there that I think is interesting. Love to see it just put all these services together, even, you know, like the zoom info, like getting the leads in there as well. So eventually, like, I, I, I think you can you really build the full stack here, really fascinating. Um, and startups are a great place to um, start selling into because they're resource constrained, they're clever, and they're willing to adopt new technologies because they're looking for an advantage over the big companies. And they, they're very promiscuous when it comes to trying new things or maybe um, seeking out new solutions so that they get an edge on their larger competitors who have more resources and can throw people or money or advertising. You know, a startup with five people, they may not have a bunch of cash laying around. So they will use uh, services like yours. So really well done. Okay, so now I got to make a decision which one I would invest in. Um, and so let's go back and forth through these. Um, and tell me when we put it through 
the launch system of evaluating a company and the qualities we look for in a company candidly which qualities uh did each of these companies tick off let's go through each one and we have the reasons why we like to invest in a company so what did our team come up with here investing uh at our firm is a team sport um but we like to make individual decisions so we act as a team when we deliberate on which companies to invest in and then we like somebody to take ownership of that investment so let's do the deliberation process here um tell me about one of the companies and what were the things that you have of why we should invest and i'll challenge you on those yeah okay cool so um let's do master tech the couple tags here builder founders that's um linda and her co-founder builders how what specifically yeah yeah so linda is a was head of engineering at uh pokemon go at niantic um and then also at microsoft i believe as well so that qualifies the builder founders there um, and she has a co-founder as well. Okay, so there's co-founders. We like that. And then she's an actual engineer. Is she writing the code for this startup? Because you know that's going to be my follow-up question. You know, sometimes we'll have uh, somebody on the team will say, oh, it's a builder founder. They're a developer. But they're not actually writing the code for this company. The last time they wrote code was, you know, when Bill Clinton was president. And, you know, they were a frontline coder. We're looking for people who are writing code today. So is she writing code? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So we have builder founders. That's great. Um, and we have two co founders, two reasons. What else do we have in there of reasons of why we might invest? Yeah, the other is a business model or a core what we call our core five business models. Um, and so in this case, uh, master tech is a software as a service. And that is what we consider our core five. Okay, SaaS subscription, pretty straightforward. Uh, so we have three great qualities here out of the 13 that we look for currently. Some of the other ones would be um, world class design. This doesn't have world class design yet. We would define world class design in our rubric as um, Apple would feature it as the app of the day. Obviously, we're not there yet. Um, you know, like Calm or Robinhood level award winning design. So when we see award winning design, we might check that box off. That's not the case here or for any of the companies here today yet. And we we very rarely see that. Um, had a previous exit before. That's not the case here, or have raised venture capital, not the case here. Those are two of the other qualities we look for. Product velocity, not yet the case here, but they're getting there. So we have three solid qualities. And then conversely, reasons to not invest. What would be some reasons we might not invest in this company in your mind, Fresh? Yeah. So, I mean, one is, and you uh, mentioned it earlier, was can't um, other AI models just do the same thing if you give them the information? Um, and so that might be a concern, right? these models are getting so good. That would be something to flag. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, how, how do you compete against what you can natively do? Great. Let's assess the next startup of why we might invest in the next startup. So we we ask ourselves these two questions internally, we try to have a dialogue. This is an abridged version of it, why we should invest why we shouldn't invest. When we see two or three reasons to invest, we get curious, take a second or third meeting, uh, let alone four or five or six reasons. And when we see two, three, four, five reasons to not invest, red flags, let's call them, um, you know, we may work with the founder and say, hey, we have these concerns. What do you think, right? And one of the concerns might be there's an accounting problem, or maybe they uh, diluted the equity too much. Um, you know, uh, you know, maybe it's too competitive a field, a slow sales cycle, to all different reasons of why you might not invest in a startup. So let's do the next one. All right. Next one, let's do umbrella sports. So Jared's company, another thing here, builder founder, uh, you can see a theme here. Um, Jared was um, led UX at uh, a golfing company um, prior, and also has two other co founders. Got it. So we have multiple co founders. And uh, at least we know one of them is a, a builder. The other two, are they builders or not? Do you know, they are, uh, I'm pretty sure certain there are uh, one is a CTO, and then one is the product person as well. So does a CTO, the, what I would want to double click on there is, is the CTO actually writing code or are the other two founders writing the code when they say their product, product manager, that's not really what we're looking for in terms of a builder. We're looking for somebody who actually does the actual design, the UX, putting those pixels together. Uh, but okay, we'll, we'll go with builder founders. Sounds like it's probable that the builders are writing the code. Great. We'll get confirmation yeah. on that. 
The other one is uh, capital efficiency. Um, oh, okay. Capital efficient. Um, so they're doing a hardware product and they were able to sell hundreds of units um, at the start by joining Founder University um, within the program. So we flagged that as interesting because building a hardware product isn't easy and they were able to ship the product. So to be clear, one of the 13 reasons we look for in a startup is capital efficiency. Can they get a lot done with a small amount of resources? Why is that important? Startups are almost always resource constrained. So if you're capital efficient, in other words, the product is improving constantly um, with very small amounts of capital, which typically indicates you have builder founders and multiple co-founders because they don't need to get paid or they might be just taking a small draw. This is why in Silicon Valley and in the startup ecosystem, the small teams with builders are capital efficient, they get product velocity, and ultimately they learn more. So we're giving you the secrets of how we decide who to invest in. But you can also reverse engineer those founders who are listening to this week in startups and understand why. Why are investors obsessed with multiple co founders who are good builders and are uh, capital efficient? and have world class design? It's because we've seen this movie before. Capital efficient teams with builder founders and multiple co founders, they just tend to go further faster. Uh, I think another one which was, uh, we have uh, one of our tags is product velocity. Yes. Um, right. And uh, we set we we track that from we do it something what we call the weekly update in Foundry University. So we can see week over week changes. Um, how the product is evolving. And that's how we track that. And so we flag this because each week there was something new in the product um, that Jared and the team had done. So product velocity is super important. The teams that can release more products, run more experiments, as we call them in the industry, they're going to learn more. And so if you have product velocity, fantastic. That's great for learning more about your customers. Some teams take a year to release a feature. Some of them push new features every week. The people who push new features every week, remove old features that aren't working every week, they tend to learn more, go faster, and build better companies. So product velocity, absolutely critically important. So this company has builder founders, product velocities, and they're capital efficient, and they're moving to a subscription model, which we like. There's four really great features of this startup team. Okay. And let's do one more. And last one is Ellis, Alexander, this company. So. We had builder founders here. Um, both of the co-founders are technical and are writing code. So you have two people writing code. That's really exciting for us. When we see two developers writing code, you know, whether they're pair programming or not, but man, you just think about product velocity and shipping code. That's yum yum for us. And for the founders, right? They're going to learn more about their customers. Great. And it makes sense. If you look, they showed all those things they bolt together fresh. It's like there's 20 startups being, you know, um, abstracted into one service, you're going to need to push a lot of code. That's true. Um, The other interesting piece is serial team. So uh, Alexander and his co founder work together on a startup. Great. So serial team, builder founders, did they have product velocity? I assume they do. They do. Yep. Okay, great. They don't have world class design. Um, uh, What else do they have? And then business model. Oh, great. So four. So when you look at this, uh, as I said earlier, somebody gets to three, four reasons to invest, we're going to get curious, we're going to say, hey, I wonder if they um, will add more to this mix. Now you can't have a previous exit, or have work together, or have raised venture capital before those three things are just historical facts, right? You can't change those. But you could have world class design, you could find a world class designer, give them 500 bucks, 5000 bucks, whatever it is in between, maybe you do what we've done press you and I have actually done this over the years of working together, where I said, do me a favor, I just don't trust that these designers are going to get us anything, just hire three, give them $500 each to make one screen. And then remember when I would do this, then whichever two are best, give them $1,000 to do the next phase of this, whichever one's best, give them another $2,000. And so 2000 for the final stage, 2000 1000 each for the first, second phase, $500 each, two, two, $1,500, $5, $500 to get three people to kind of work towards an outcome. Um, and those kind of strategies can work, but you need time uh, and you need a little bit of capital.
Hey startups, you're a new company and you're looking to form your business, but navigating through a maze of hidden fees and legal jargon, it's complicated. It's going to eat up all your time. Well, Northwest Registered Agent will form your business quickly and easily, and it only takes 10 clicks in 10 minutes. They provide you with a full business identity setup. That means they'll give you everything you need to start and to maintain your business. When you hire a registered agent to form your company, they take care of everything. You get a registered agent service, a business address, their corporate guide service, a phone line, mail scanning, a free domain, a website, and hosting. Northwest Registered Agent makes the whole process transparent, quick, and enjoyable. Whether you're setting up an LLC, a corporation, or a nonprofit, they've got you covered. Here's your call to action. For just $39 plus state fees, Northwest Registered Agent will form your company and launch your business in minutes visit northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist today that's northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist today so now that gets us to the big point hmm you can only pick one Presh. which one do you think is going to give us and our lps the greatest return on investment which one has hmm. the highest chance of getting a return and we're looking for as a siege stage company Every company should have the ability to return 100x. So if we're investing in the seed stage at an accelerator level, might be a million, $2 million valuation when you go to an accelerator or pre-accelerator, seed stage, four to eight million, or pre-seed, you know, tends to be, let's call it three to seven million. Seed stage tends to be five to 12 million. So valuations, 100 times that, you got to get to a couple of hundred million dollar valuation for your company, at least to get a hundred X for your pre seed seed and stage investors. So which one do you think could earn a hundred times our LPs money, our limited partners money? If you had to yeah, just pick one. It's a great question. Pick yeah. one. So I think I like master tech for this reason. And, uh, the reason is I think on so on the master tech slide of the market, um, Linda had showed 240,000, um, auto, auto repair shops in the U S. And then of that, um, they needed to get to 10,000, I believe, to get to $10 million in ARR. Um, so those numbers, that seems doable. And then to get to 100 million, I think it was um, 10,000 um, or around that number. And so that seems like a very clear path of how they get there, charging $300 to these shops. Got it. So you looked at the bottom up total addressable market, the TAM that she created, and it made logical sense to you that their team, if they get product market fit, could execute and get to thousands and then low tens of thousands of garages, mechanics here in the United States. And it's a believable story um, that they would get enough value to spend 300 bucks a month on this product. I tend to agree with you. It does feel like they have the straight shot as a SaaS product to, to get there. Uh, SaaS products can be very boring, but also Ellis, um, also kind of boring. Um, and there's a straight shot there as well. And you have two developer co-founders. So I was going to go with Alice first. Then I was going to go, uh, with master tech. Um, and then, you know, consumers hard. Um, but I'm looking at all three and uh, who's your number two in that? Uh, number two is Alice. Okay. So, and I guess it's similar reasons. Yeah. Okay. So this really comes down to business to business versus consumer consumer is really hard it's fickle but again our top two investments in history are oh robin hood robin hood right so our top yeah. three investments in terms of returns for our investors uber robin hood com so here we are we're saying well wait a second the SaaS company feels like it's the better investment but wait we are three of the top three are consumer businesses and so it turns out consumer businesses when they hit they get gigantic why there's a lot of consumers so, uh, you know, business to business, though, smaller outcomes, but less risk. Let's bring our founders back. Um, I just want to just commend everybody for building real businesses. Welcome back, Linda, Jared, uh, Alexander. These are all real businesses. You've got a lot of work ahead of you, but you can only invest in one. Only invest in one. Precious giving me his feedback. You've heard the feedback. Oh, wait a second. I'm the GP. I'm the founder of the fund. I can do whatever I want. I would like to invest in all three of your companies. Is that acceptable to all three of you? Absolutely. Jared, is it okay? Can we be partners, Jared? It's okay? For sure. 
Okay. Linda, can we be on this adventure together? Try to Absolutely. build something here? Okay. Alexander, Super are you excited. cool with uh, having me on Absolutely. the cap table? Yes, yes. All right. Okay. Everybody gets money. Uh, if you want to get money, have us on your team. You want to be part of the excitement of building startups? Well, don't. It's too hard. Do not apply. Do not be involved in startups. Do not invest in startups. It's too hard. I don't want anybody who hears my voice right now investing in startups, and I don't want you creating startups. However, if you are the lunatic who, when you hear this, say, I'm going to prove J-Cal wrong, I'm going to do it anyway, that's the, that's the person I'm talking to right now. But for the rest of you, far too hard. Linda, Jarrett, Alexander, you're lunatics. You're going to suffer for years. There's a very slim chance of success, high chance of failure, pain, suffering, missed weekends. You're not going to Coachella. You're going to just sacrifice and you're going to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week with the default case, absolute failure and embarrassment. But with that small chance that maybe, maybe, maybe we hit the bullseye. Okay. And that makes it all worthwhile. Uh, but if you're listening to this and you're questioning it, hmm, probably not for you. But if you think, you know what? I want to give it a shot. I want to really work hard. I want to put 60, 70, 80, 90 hours in a week. And, you know, all due respect to Microsoft, you know, or working at Google or Uber, those are all great things you can do with your life. But if you want to get to the end of your life and say, hmm, I had that itch and I didn't scratch it, I had that shot and I didn't take it. Well, if that's you, go to founder.university and apply to come to the 12-week program. Um, Linda, I'll just go around the horn here as we finish up and we start this adventure together uh, to try to build these companies. Um, what, what, what was great about Founder University? What can we improve? Because we're always trying to make our product a little bit better. Well, we, for you personally, what, what was the highlight of Founder University? What did you love about it? And what can we improve? I'm not going to say, what did you hate? But, you know, is there, is there something we could improve in the curriculum or the process? Yeah. Um, so for me, the, the biggest thing that I, I love about Founder University was the community. So as I started out on this uh, journey, it, it, it turns out being a founder is very lonely and mm. just being able to network to see other founders going through similar challenges and struggles and perseverance through them. Like it's mm. very inspiring. And that has been the, the, the biggest thing that that's benefited me. Fantastic. What can we do better? Um, I, I think like maybe some of the curriculum could be a little bit tighter or maybe even more networking opportunities where mm. people can get together. Fantastic. Okay, so we got to work on the curriculum. We're going to get, um, we're going to get some feedback for you offline about what specifically we could do better, but more opportunity to get together. And uh, hey, we're doing Founder Fridays now, so that is uh, something we're doing. I think you can go to founderfridays.tech, the amazing .tech domain name. Yep. Is that what we're using, Presh? Yep, that's right. That's okay. the main page. So we're trying to combat loneliness. We created Founder Fridays. Pretty simple. Uh, you uh, host a local meetup in your city. Hopefully it's two to 12 people, I think is the right number. These things seem to be getting large. Uh, we can pull up founderfridays.tech and you can see some pictures from these Founder Fridays. We've been putting these on, trying to keep them small. They've been getting too big, I think. I'm starting to sound like Trump. They're getting too big, okay? Try to keep them small, boutique All right, how much do we love our founders? Founderfridays.tech. Uh, and we'll work on our curriculum. Uh, but you should host one, Linda. And you know, now that you've got us on the cap table, what city are you in, Linda? Uh, I'm just outside of Seattle. Perfect. So you'd be perfect for you to host the Seattle one or join in on that. Every the first Friday of every month, we try to host these during the day. Could be at night. Could be in the morning for breakfast. Could be lunch. Could be co-working session in the afternoon. The only thing is, you have to be a founder to come. You can't come as a uh, service provider if you work for. Amazon Web Services or AWS, if you're a lawyer, an accountant, any of those great people, service providers, this isn't the event for you. This is only for founders. We might let you buy coffee or something in the future. Maybe we'll let one service provider in. Okay, Linda, thank you for the feedback. Jared, what did you love about Founder University? And what could we do better? Well, I uh, absolutely loved working with Kelly and Presh. Uh, oh, fantastic. Yes, they're fantastic. Both times around. Yeah. Um, was able to make the kickoff in person this year in San Francisco, Great, which yes. was incredible. Um, I love your honesty. Oh. I think for me, uh, being a designer, I, I crave honesty and, and real feedback. And so mm. that's been extremely precious to us throughout all this. Um, ideas come cheap. Ideas are easy. Making that idea a business 
however, is something completely different. Yeah. Um, and I've been learning a lot. So very appreciative of everything uh, from Founders University. Great. Anything we could do better? Uh, for me, there's a lot of content. Uh, mm. It's a lot to digest. Um, uh, there is a great wiki that you offer. Um, mm. I would love to be able to spend uh, more in-depth time with those speakers. Um, wh whether or not that's a sort of a tangential session uh, or a separate thing. But I, I love the pacing that you have. I just would love there are certain topics to dig into a little bit further. You know, it's really great feedback. We have Linda saying, give us more content. <laughs> You're saying I need more time one on one with the speakers, maybe to go more in depth. And, and you know, one size does not fit all. And so now that we're going to be on your cap table, you're going to get into the super secret slack room with 800 other founders we backed over the years. I think we've done 400 startups now. So it's like 800 founders in there. And then founder Fridays, you know, we we, we try to do um, quietly events for our founders. So we do like these office hours, etc. And, and you can help with that if you're a great designer. Maybe you could lead a roundtable discussion on design and refining your design. So great feedback. And we're trying to do more, you know, one to few events, I call them. Uh, this is like the point of Founder Fridays. Anybody can throw an event for a 1000 people just put out beer and pizza and say startups and 1000 people show up if you make it free and you put out beer and pizza. And then you know, anybody can do a one on one meeting. But to get people to consistently come every month, on the first Friday of a month to a 10 person meetup, and have the same eight, nine, 10 people show up, that's where the magic is. So that's what I'm obsessed with. Okay, Alexander. What did you love about Founder University? What did we get right? Uh, what did we need to improve on? I love the the people first and foremost. Mm. Uh, I loved Presh. I loved you, Jason. Loved Kelly. Okay. I loved the structure. I loved giving the weekly update every Monday mm. and the Thursday bonus section. When mm. you're a founder, the the world is really unstructured. So having a consistent Monday meeting where you have to report everything you've done was was nice. Uh. Um, for things to work on, it would be awesome if that meeting was in person so that we could mm. get to know the other people more. I would have loved to uh, have that same vibe that we had at the in-person kickoff every week. I mean, that would be awesome, especially yeah. for the Bay Area founders. Yeah. Okay. There you have it. So there's something for us to work on. Uh, Presh, everybody says, you know what they want? More in-person, more learning, more curriculum. I think we're starting to see a theme. The right founders love accountability they love that monday being accountable yeah. uh, to themselves their team investors and the right founders man they're sponges the, you can never give them too much information if you give them too much information they're just going to be like jared which is you know oh get me i need this expert get me more time with them so we can never uh, work hard enough to get great information and networking for our founders it's so obvious uh, but I appreciate y'all reinforcing it. Make sure we clip this press and we give our yeah. candid reviews to the rest of our 20 person, 21 person team at launch. We work really hard. Thank you to my team, Kelly Press, everybody involved, uh, Heidi, uh, the sales team, which helps, uh, you know, keep the lights on here, Hannah, Jamie, Matt, uh, and then all the, the investment team from Mike Savino to Ashley to Jackie, to Kelly, everybody. Heidi uh, working really hard in the young guns, Andre, Bianca, all doing a great job. Uh, Caitlin, uh, who did I miss? I miss anybody? I'm sure I missed somebody. But great job, everybody. If you're passionate about startups, and you want to be the coordinator of Founder Fridays, which means working with like 100 cities and the river team, I'm looking for somebody either half time or full time, a paid position, just to work and, and keep that project going because we're so busy investing in companies, founders are so busy. We need a coordinator. So if you want to be the founder of Fridays, I guess in the old days, we call it a list mom. Um, you know, the person who makes sure uh, and, and mothers the group and, uh, you know, per parents the group and keeps everything moving forward. We're looking for like a list mom, a manager, a GM of founder Fridays paid position. You know, I'm not expecting anybody to do it for free. Uh, I think minimum 20 hours a week, maximum, you know, full time. But you know, it's a remote position. Looking for somebody great. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.